world. Uh, oh, hello. <laughs> um, so, Sorry, yeah, Shita. Uh, I forgot to start the recording, so I just started now. Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem at all. So, yes, I'm just about to give an introduction of uh, Philippe. Um, and, uh, yeah, so Philippe basically entered his digital journey in 1995. Um, he graduated in, um, uh, was it business, I'm thinking? Business, yes. yes. The, the, the sort of French MBA type thing. French MBA, and that was in France, wasn't it? And hence he yeah. moved to the UK in 96, started his job at KPMG and Capgemini, where he worked with multiple digital agencies um, and also worked as a coder. So um, it's always a good sign. I have this bias to think, bias to approach, but I think most coders make great agile coaches. So that's just me. Um, he moved to Sapiens in 2004, where his first encounter for agile really started to come into shape. Um, and uh, he, he did a whole bunch of work with retail brands like O2, Singapore Airlines, Marks and Spencers, even Ladbrokes. Um, and there he started to dabble in Agile and really came to the centre um, when he started working for Barclays. Um, there he was actually a portfolio director where he was manning about 300 people. Wow, well, Philippe, that's, that's kind of a big thing. Um, and it's one of the first teams uh, around 2010 where you introduced... Um, an agile strategy that really came to the fore. Um, and I think it was that point onwards where you started to kind of really find your coaching um, te techniques and expertise. Um, and so from that point onwards, around 2010, Philippe became a portfolio delivery manager, agile, an agile portfolio delivery um, person who was really focusing on flow being Philippe's key go-to um, area of expertise, in my opinion, anyway. Um, I think he's a great coach. Um, and, uh, you know, following on from that, he's an, he's an ICF coach, which is awesome. Um, and today, and th since then, he's been coaching in digital leadership um, and has made real great waves uh, working for some awesome companies. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy to be. I'm really proud to be working with him. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we met actually before Agile Tour, at a dinner before Agile Tour many, many years ago. Uh, and I've been in touch with Hital ever since, uh, on and off, you know, talking about Agile things. And one thing I discovered, actually, we have been trading places. Um, Hital went to, um, I mean, had a choice of a career between beautician and, 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 and IT, and fortunately choose the right path of IT, um, and, and did a lot of coding uh, in the early days uh, for multiple organizations working in, in a new digital uh, arena, doing websites, um, and interestingly worked for BMI uh, in Edinburgh and was a fan of the castle, and don't forget that part. Um, and, and then carried on uh, working with a number of organizations, uh, Top Shot, Santander, doing one of the first sort of banking websites for a bank uh, in the UK, uh, online banking, uh, but then started getting a bit fed up and a bit blind with the coding and decided to actually take more of an analyst role uh, and, and ended up doing PMing as well, which well, was hateful. <laughs> and, uh, and then went to France, and that's where we kind of traded places went to France, uh, did some work there in the, the French Silicon Valley near Nice, which is absolutely paradisiac, I can tell you. I studied around there um, and uh, speaks very well French, actually, uh, and, and lived in a castle, int interestingly enough, during that time. Um, and, and then progressed, actually, uh, to discover Agile working for Amadeusia. Uh, discovering Agile and, um, you know, in the early days of Agile, you were the guy that knew how to spell Scrum or the girl that, in that case, absolutely, that knew how to spell Scrum and, and, and suddenly you were working things out. And, and during that time, uh, Sital just learned Agile, you know, from the ground up, what worked, what didn't, uh, and, and progressed uh, through, through the, um, to become a coach because, of many teams were in place. And eventually um, pitching you know, as, as companies uh, to, do, to do some work back in the UK, um, you recognize that it was actually possible to win business as an independent and went uh, with ASEAN Consulting to become an independent and also creating since 2016 uh, a meetup uh, to share agile thinking. Um, 
So I know, I'm also honored uh, to present with Sital because we've been crossing paths so many times and, and we get to do something together today. So great, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Felipe. And uh, yeah, it's, it's such a, um, a great thing. So we've been talking and having debates around the agile ways of working and flow distribution and also, um, you know, things on, um, you know, how to do philosophy, all of these great things in, in the agile world we've been talking about, um, you know, and debating over. So actually coming together and talking together is actually pretty awesome. So next step. So after 20 years, where have we landed with Agile? So I'm actually going to invite you all to a little... Um, uh, uh, Which I'm going to start. Yes. So I'd like you to come and vote with us. Um, so basically, tell me where you think we are in terms of Agile after 20 years. So you can click on any of those four and, and based on where, where your organization is at, and it's about one minute for the vote, um, if you want to tell us where, where things are in your organization. Yeah. So is it that software systems and organization are of great quality? There's no technical debt. Have you finally made it? Um, are you delivering work in a smooth flow with great collaboration between functional business and engineering? Or are organizations innovating and competing, strong, competing strongly in the digital marketplace and they're not being disrupted anymore? Or do you think we actually taught the agile language, but it's still a bit more pigeon agile than native agile? Where do you think we are? The plus button, I think. So it's preparing the results now. See the full results. So it's still very much the pigeon agile. And, and we guess that when we put that, because that's the experience we have as well. Uh, and, and hence the picture on the next um, slide. So six vote to the pigeon agile and one vote to uh, delivering work is a smooth flow with great collaboration between functional business and engineering, which is a great place to be in that, that organization. Yeah, but as we know, you know, we still have a lot of organizations talking pigeon agile where they, they're using all the buzzwords and they're all coming out probably in the right places, actually, in some place, in some cases. Um, but still, it's still pigeon, the, the meaning and the essence behind all of these buzzwords are still not quite showing through. And I actually completely agree with that. So when we're actually looking to put Agile into play, um, what we um, are doing is we're, we're assuming that it's going to be one straight line. And this is a great reference from the flow system um, who have actually demonstrated a really good example of what flow could look like. Um, this is how we think work gets done. Um, but actually, this is what really happens. Um, you've got like, you know, you, you've got full intentions, you've got a vision in mind, you've got your goal in mind, but actually when you start the flow journey and when you start working on something, you're literally going to hit rocks or you might kind of um, get attacked by an eagle or, you know, you may find yourself um, on a, in, the, in the middle of a cable car stuck in the middle of a snowstorm um, or you may encounter a tiger or, you know, a shark under your waters or it might rain. Um, or you might be firefighting or, you know, there might be, you know, some water under the bridge that you need to move through. Um, and it, there's a whole whirlwind of actual problems and issues that you encounter when you're trying to go from a starting point of delivering a great piece of work with full great intentions to delivering the actual piece of work. Um, there's dependencies that get in the way. There's the, uh, delays that come along. There's a uh, high non-negotiable items that get in the way. All of these um, come in the way. So um, it's never always a perfect journey. And um, you know that makes us wonder what agile has not fixed. And if you think about the regular things, is strategy gets done upstairs. You know the budgeting, the planning cycle, the the scheduling. All those things happen. And then we do an agile bit, and then you know, and then we launch a deadline. But fundamentally, the whole chain, the macro chain, is not agile at all. And and executing in an agile way in the middle of all this is is very very challenged. And because everything is pushed, there is always too much work in progress, too many constraints to actually work smoothly. 
And we, we, we put that cartoon using, using the, the elements of the flow system, we put that cartoon together um, where you know, from the CEO level, it's, you know, I need you to be the best team, the best organization that disrupt the market. That's what the CEO dreams and reinvent the business. You know, is that agile transformation finally complex, complete or what? You know, they also expect people to work agile at the same time. And the CFO will add, you know, cost or too high, you know, sales or too slow. Uh, we, need to, we need to reduce our source IT. You know, those engineers are too expensive. And the CMO, you know, saying, why is that redesign? I've been waiting for so long. And in that boardroom, the CIO is actually really pressured and feeling, you know, if I say no, I'm done. If I say yes, we're all doomed in IT. And, and then, you know, the CIO becomes a tiger in the, in the IT boardroom. Um, and if, if I move to the next slide, let me uh, bring everybody. And, and, and as a tiger in that IT boardroom, they would say, you know, or we have, to, we have to get this done. This is hard, this is late, this is challenging, but it has very high visibility. And, and they pass on that problem. Uh, and then, you know, the stakeholders want clear estimates, they want commitment, and the last project was late. The digital officer thinks, oh, maybe I, would, I could do some, some sort of refresh of the, the UI. And the project managers, all the ones seeing all the scope, you know, sort of uh, adding up. And, and again, just thinking, oh, we're, we're going to be doomed. Uh, I may as well sort of contact that, that head hunter again. And then moving on you know, to the next one. And, and, and it is about that product manager or project manager, you know, comes as a, as a lion or the tiger again and with the teams uh, and says, you know, this is, this feels like another one of those, but it has no choice, very high visibility, it has to, it has to get done. And, and because we're agile, it should be better, it should be easier. And, and the architects are piling some more on and, and the engineers also, you know, just saying, well, we need to refresh, we need to redo those things because there's too much tech debt. And the engineering team at the receiving end of that, always has a receiving end of that. And, and all those decisions take months and then the execution has to be done on the, on the flip of a coin. And, and all this is kind of where the problems start to appear. And unless we sort that out, unless we try and solve this, it's very, very difficult to actually function in, in an agile way, but in an agile way that brings agility to the enterprise. And you know, from this, I, I, you know, we, we try and unlearn here. That's what we're trying to do. So we welcome your takeaway and we're gonna walk you through some of the takeaways of our own. Uh, whilst we welcome you to capture some takeaways on the blue, the blue post-it. Sita, yeah. do you want to? Yeah, definitely. So, so the takeaways that we, we feel around enterprise and flow agility are things like around the like idea of work initiation. Um, it tends to flow from top down at the moment. Um, so without having that buy-in, it's almost impossible to really get a solid kind of um, heartbeat going into the organization. Um, so uh, there's often, you know, from the top, there's always so much pressure coming in. This, everything's a high priority. Everything must get done today or yesterday. I mean, how often have you heard the term, oh, when do you need it by? And they've said to you yesterday. Um, you know, we hear that sort of thing all the time in organizations. Um, you know, so what, we, what we're looking for, but what we're still struggling to find is room for ideas uh, to emerge from the bottom up and actually have them putting, uh, going into play and being, um, you know, developed on and grown as well and kind of nurtured in a certain kind of way as well. Um, Luke, what about yourself? Is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, an interesting point is that there's kind of an institutionalized bullying happening. And, and that's a big word I know, uh, but I, I, I struggle to find another word. You know, we say to people, it's very important. It's, you know, it's high profile, it's high visibility. And, and people have to sacrifice their own family time, their weekends, whatever it is, or, or their late night working for those sort of things. And interestingly, nobody likes that. No leader likes to ask that from their people, but it is so systemic and institutionalized in organization. It seems to be 
the only way to get things done in organizations. And, and that is at the core of actually the challenges of doing Agile well, operating in Agile well. So it's interesting, we have a few, a few, few suggestions uh, of, of your own, which are just you know, even more valuable because they are our way of probing what's happening for you. Uh, so Agile is not efficient. Agile provides more effectiveness, which is a very good point. Managers and CIOs will think uh, we don't have the end of this one. Resistance is very strong in companies. I think, I think, um, uh, I think if there's a build away with that one, so managers and CIOs who think, I think it's, that's exactly what it's meant to say. I, I mean, correct, please correct ah, yeah, me if yeah. I'm wrong, but it's, it's about, you know, um, we need people who've had more time to think and, you know, put, them th put their thinking out there. Is that, is that what you were referring to? You can please come up, come off mute if you. And that's an interesting one as well. I don't know if they, they're going to come on the, the audio, uh, but it's hard to change the system when you are in the system. Yes. But it's even yeah. harder when you're out of the system, to be honest. And that's often when we are. That's uh, a fair point. I guess um, just to add my thought, I'm, I'm kind of full term. So I just I sometimes got this feeling that it would be easier if I was a contractor, but then I've never been a contractor. So don't, don't hold me to that. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, being already within the, the management hierarchy, I already have a you know a reporting line, and it's you know it just gets harder to to change. Well, it feels to me like it's harder to change the the overall system when you're actually already part of it. Yeah, it, it, there needs to be that element of fearlessness, and almost um, that fear can almost come with uh, dire consequences, so to speak. Um, so actually, yeah, I, I hear you, and I think from that perspective. Um, Good management in my in my view would be that you know you see a systemic issue you see a problem you let people have a voice without feeling like you're going to have to you know reprimand them for whatever reason yeah um, you know it's i think it's an essential part of today's organizations to initiate something like that um and you know one of the key ones that we've also mentioned here is organizations are sitting on a time bomb of retaining talent and that's a really big one because I think there's a lot of frustration in the air in amongst many organizations where there's so much to be done, but there's also so many ambitions to be more agile as well. And people know and understand what the value is, but actually um, getting that, that you know, um, letting go of the reins has been quite, quite a challenge, really. Um, so what tends to happen is that there's a churn rate. So people end up leaving and moving on to a place where they can be free, where they can be more agile and where they can, uh, you know, use their talent at the same time. And, you know, I've, I've seen many organizations like that where you, you have to invest in the people. Mm -hmm. and, and if the people come and go all the time, because you're not in a culture that, that works for, uh, for them, uh, you end up uh, uh, losing people and, and having to use suppliers, which actually kill your own culture. Um, so it's, um, it's a tricky, tricky point. But we're going to have to move on because there's plenty more to cover. Um, and the idea um, next and, and, um, is actually to create flow, to create flow system. And, and the idea of that, you know, the organization become flow systems uh, and, and the idea of it is that we need to resolve the constraints and make the system of work continually better. We need to make it completely frictionless to add value. So all the work people do needs to be about adding value. And there should be as little friction as possible. So, you know, that's kind of an idealistic thing. Uh, but the idea of creating flow system, it's the role of the leadership to create flow systems. And, and the main idea of them is, is not coordinating the flow, but creating the flow of value. So that's what we're going to cover in the rest is how do we pivot to, to creating that? Yeah, so how, absolutely. How do we move to work systems where everybody is able to continuously and frictionlessly add value? And adding value also has different meanings and connotations in different, different companies as well. Um, but uh, so... My, my analogy and something that I've always kind of tried to explain when I'm coaching as well is that what we tend to do is we come up with all these amazing ideas and here are a whole bunch of agile buzzwords here that you might find as well. Um, lean startups, DevOps, cloud, safe, 
agile mindset, change management strategy, psychological safety, more coaches, big data, AI, all of this stuff is really good. But what's happening is that you're putting the plaster over a plaster, over a plaster, over a plaster. So what you're doing is you're getting a huge buildup of all these sticky processes and solutions. So what, what's really happening in most organizations is that things are not being removed before a new solution has been added. It's just a plaster that's being put on top of another plaster. And what we want to do is we want to come away from that and pretty much slam dunk, dunk um, complexity out of organizations and actually move strategies, the agile mindset, safe, all of this good stuff into the organizations. But you really have to think about what you need to do to pivot in these organizations and where that pivot needs to exist as well. And um, hence, um, you know, finding your true North Star, you've got to find a way and a strategy to enable those flow systems so that um, you can streamline your flow and streamline your delivery. And, and there is, you know, just to, to also explain, there is nothing wrong individually with any of those tickets, but they seem to be sold in the industry as being the solution mm -hmm. to fix, you know, whatever is not working with Agile. And at the end of the day, there is not really one root cause and one solution or one method that is going to make it completely right. And, and the idea of pivot is if you, if you, train a bit in complexity, uh, there is this idea that um, in an ordered world, there are solutions, there are non-solutions to problems, and you know, applying those methods will solve the problem. But in a more complex environment, and organizations are very complex environment, um, it's not about trying to find the root cause, because anytime you drill down to that root cause, it gets more diffuse. There's many reasons why the thing doesn't work. And, and it's, a, it's a question of creating enablement, creating, and um, Dave Snowden talks about enabling constraints. It's finding a way to create new constraints in the organization and, and new enablement agency and so on that will enable a pivot. And that pivot we're proposing here is looking at creating flow systems, organizations that are focused on creating flow. Uh, and if, if, um, if we go through the next slide, you know, flow is a concept that many of you probably understand from automotive. Uh, and it's very common in production environment because there is this thing called tack time. And, and we know to repeat a task, it takes that much longer, uh, uh, that long. And, you know, it's repeatable. And some elements in technology are repeatable. And uh, delivering software to production, for instance, with DevOps, we're trying to make that chain repeatable, error-free, uh, and you know, very fast and consistent. And we need that. And we need that so we can actually take the time to think about the things that are not repeatable, that are about solving a customer problem. And this is where you know, flow in digital environment. Uh, and, and if we go to, to this image of uh, carbon fiber weave, and uh, the, the software, the ideation, designing and production are completely linked. They are interwoven. And that's what we're trying to create. And you know, being able to make those things work into a flow where there's inherent viability. So, and you know, I often talk, but I'm going to let Sital talk, talk to us through that one because you, you made a brilliant addition with a heart in the middle. Um, yeah. so, it's a balancing uh, act, really. Yes, exactly. It is, it is a balancing act. Um, so what we do, you know, the idea of um, introducing the flow, you need to be able to kind of allow room for innovation that in turn then introduces operational excellence. But it's that word pivot, the the, the the capability of being adaptable in today's work world, I think, is the heart of flow at the moment, is to be able to course correct and kind of take a different route if you absolutely need to. Um, and it will be the innovation piece that's the piece that will actually help you find those operational excellences um, and, uh, yeah, allow you to kind of... Uh, I think what I'm trying to say is that you, you need that opportunity to explore 
the flow of how things go through your organization and actually having that adaptability is kind of a key thing it's the heart of it really yeah absolutely and and the thing about uh, adaptability and, and balancing act of innovation and, and operational excellence is it's completely contextual to every organization uh, each organization will be very very different to each other and trying to normalize on something is actually unhelpful what organization need to do and, and that's the next one it's adaptability is building flow it is the job of leadership to figure how to improve flow relentlessly and everybody can act as a leader by the way so it's not just the hierarchy that is here to solve the problem although they are here to solve the more systemic problems but it is for everybody to work on improving the flow all the time and there's no magic wand method it's not a method it is actually a, an idea or concept but also a, a, an endeavor you always take how can we improve the flow of doing something how can we improve the value of doing something? We talk about flow of value. Uh, and it is the job of everybody to continuously reflect on that. Hence why you know, retros and so on are so important. Yeah, but there's also, you know, things like, you know, your metrics and your measures that will also help tell a story on flow. Um, you know, for example, how can you make sure that when you actually go, all the work is flowing through your organizations, are you delivering the value? Is it value that you're focusing on or are you just working on tech debt or are you fixing bugs all day long? Mm -hmm. You know, think about things like that and that adaptability um, by looking at flow and, um, you know, kind of measuring it to a certain degree as well to help you tell that story is absolutely critical to then, you know, the point number two, acting as a leader. Sorry, uh, Philippe, but that piece about acting as a leader means anyone can lead the flow. And, and I think it's essential for, for you to realize that. Absolutely. And, and it is, it's a simple thing. And I had that debate the other day in, a, in an organization. Uh, and I must have thought I was going mental. But the idea of everything being customer first. And, and you know, in, in that, that example, we had a meeting. And the meeting was a number of people. And I was saying that meeting is an hour. And if you take, you know, uh, average rate, that meeting would cost something like 1500 2000 pounds and that means you know the business needs to sell that much for that meeting to be useful mm -hmm. and that is taking a customer first approach in that meeting what are we deciding that's going to create value for the customer and incidentally that meeting was only about updating some stakeholders and taking a customer first perspective is actually thinking in everything we do, what is going to add value to that customer eventually. Uh, and and it, it is pretty intense. And, and, the, and Toyota puts it as highest quality, lowest cost, shortest list time. So can we, in everything we do all the time, ensure that this is what we are focusing on? Yeah. Highest quality, lowest cost, shortest list time for the customer. Yeah, which then leads to delightful experiences, right? Yeah. And very often, you know, when you get into organization, the people doing the work are not even quite clear who the customer is. So an, an easy way to get uh, to, to check that, and we're going to put you to contribution and, um, and get, so let me see, five, you, you got five votes each, two minutes, and I'm going to select what you can vote on. It's a, it's a new capability. We had all that prepared, but something had changed in my role. So I'm going to start now the vote. And you have on, and let me bring you all here. So the, the idea of assessing your flow and you know, put us uh, this value demand and failure demand, uh, but it's also investment, BAU work and understanding you know, where is the work going. So if you had 20%, each of your vote is worth 20%, can you tell us where the work went in the past months of work, let's say? So you can click on unplanned work, bug fixing incident, BAU work, tech investment, change for, and people development, and new feature and discovery work. Where is the work, work uh, you know, going? in 20% increment, five vote, please each 
vote five times and you can vote multiple times on the same thing if you think it's 40, 60, 80% going somewhere. So there's 53 seconds left. If you can vote on the on the four box on the uh, five boxes. So what this is what this will explain is um, something also known as distribution of work. Um, How do you actually vote? You just, you just click on, on the, the bottom. What well, on the buttons and the new features? Well, where it where it says new features, just click on new features or tech investments. Click on tech investments. It's not doing that. It's coming up with some. You should have a plus button on the bottom side of it. Do you not see a plus button? No. Nope. Oh, that's all. Uh, that might be a challenge. I can edit things, but I can't do anything else. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Well, we can join the call. So Come where is the work button. mainly going for you? <laughs> so I could, I could um, maybe. Um, probably a mix. So probably like one, so probably 20% bug fixing. Um, twenty percent BAU, and then probably the rest in new features. So, in in the vote in this room, we had fourteen vote on unplanned work, bug fixing, and incident. Eight vote on BAU work. Two vote on tech investment. Eight vote on change and people development, which is very impressive, by the way. And nine vote on uh, new features and discovery work. Thank you. What does that mean, Philippe? Uh, and it's, it's quite interesting that, you know, it's usual and I'm trying to. And, and if we look at, um, and where is value going? New features, discovery work is value add uh, or future value work add in the, in the case of discovery, but it's finding your way to new possibilities is definitely value add. Investment and very often, you know, uh, investment in change and people development is lacking. We do technical investment, um, but it's future value enablement. It's not current value add, it's future value enablement. BAU work is actually necessary non-value add. It's just keeping a light on. It's not changing the business. It's not incrementing more sales. It's just keeping things as they are. And unplanned work, bug fixing, incident are complete non-value add. You know, they are absolutely necessary. I'm not saying we shouldn't do them, but they're actually not adding value to the customer. Therefore, they're not value add. And we need to rebalance. And, and people very often in flow, if you show that to the business, you can actually make the case for investment. So not so much work is spent in non-valuable activity. And then you can start freeing up work for valuable activity. And that needs to be a constant dynamic in the business. And unfortunately, very often the business thinks that there is 100% time available for new feature with projects, new projects. And the rest needs to be done, but it's rarely very well funded. And as a consequence, you know, you, and it's very, very difficult to make that count um, because people get completely disrupted in their work and they're not able to provide the necessary value add in the business. So that is a, a tip, you know, looking at your work types is a good way of balancing your flow, balancing where is the work going and how can we do something about it through investment generally. Yeah, just to add to that, I would just probably say to you, if, if uh, time permits, probably screenshot this area very quickly um, and then take it into your work world and see what value you are adding in your backlog. Um, and see what's coming out the other side and, you know, figure out whether you are, you know, focusing on value add or are you just working on unplanned work and bug fixing and incidents as well. Um, and one, one other interesting thing in the chat window as well was an, a meeting costing 20k every time it happened. That's expensive, Matt. Um, and, you know, imagine all the organisations having meetings right this minute, how much that must be costing in, in the UK alone, let alone in the whole world. Um, you know, it's expensive business and having... The most frustrating thing, meeting for the sake of meetings is just a wind up as well. So it's, a, you know, trying to kind of implement a flow around value driven conversations is something that really needs to, you know, happen a bit more as well. Um, so, Philippe, I'm just conscious we've just got a few minutes left, so we should. Yeah. 
and it's very expensive when <laughs> there isn't something that will do something for the customer coming out of it, if it's just internal information. So maybe we skip the next one. Um, and, and I think we were looking at, and at you looking at making some contributions, but understanding that there's many flows in organizations. And we generally focus on the flow of work and trying to optimize it. And you need to do that, no doubt about it. But it's also to appreciate, and, and if you listen to Simon Wardley earlier on, to, to invest into industrialization, which is all about simplifying, which is about hardening, which is about uh, scaling and making faster. And you need to do that and automating and DevOps and all those things, because this will free your time to actually have time for headroom for innovation. And trying to create headroom for innovation is a continuous uh, effort. And part of it is about prioritizing improvement. So creating improvement in the work and enabling the emergence of new thinking into the strategy. So other people are contributing to that. So keep this in mind. And you know, this is in the combination of all those flows or actually creating the flow of value and as a conclusion, we'll ask you to, um, to actually capture your thoughts around uh, how the process of ways of working, you know, what you're doing in the process and ways of working to improve the flow of value in terms of strategy and organization and alignment of organization in terms of leadership and people and teamwork. So if you, if you can start capturing some things around that, and the reason we're asking this is because there is foundation to flow, which we talked about, which is coming from lean thinking, but brought into the world of digital. And then there is, you know, and, and the flow system talks about DNA strands around the teamwork and uh, the, the team science. So working in teams, something around leadership and the distribution of leadership and agency uh, through that. And something about recognizing how to work with complexity. Um, and we touched upon mainly the foundation today, uh, but there's something more about working complexity and ambiguity, uh, aligning work organizations to work together effectively and distributing the leadership uh, to make that happen. So we'll, we'll invite you to capture in the last five minutes, you know, how are you supporting or thinking about enabling and doing that pivot of enablement of the flow of value one needs to happen in your ways of working, in strategy, in leadership, or in people and teamwork collaboration. Okay, we've got four minutes to do this. Um, so, Philippe, could you just guide people to the, um, the, the frame, please? Yeah. And if you guys want to quickly complete that. And, and at this point, you know, it's, it's also the conclusion that you're writing. Uh, but we'll invite you to, to ask questions or, or, or put something up and uh, we can discuss it. So if anyone's got a question, we can answer while you're, while you're typing. Yep, and we can probably continue the questions on Slack okay. channel as well. Okay. You know, if, if there is anything, yeah, just, there's just... Yeah, I'm just you conscious can't. that session ends at 2.15. So. Yeah, the <laughs> session ends at 2.15, so we have just got three more minutes. So Thank here you. we're saying, make sure leadership delegates appropriately. And this is all about creating agency. Uh, yeah. But the delegation to make it appropriate, and I often say, if you want people to have autonomies of decision, which is agency, um, you need to equip them with the relevant information to make the good decisions. Because if they don't make good decision, that autonomy will be quickly removed. People will step in. My favorite one here is around making sure teams are not siloed. Um, one of uh, an effective way of actually breaking silo is also related to flow and the efficiency of flow. Um, if you've heard of the value stream mapping, I would certainly just ask you to just pull your colleagues into a room and say, right, let's go through a value stream mapping, which is your end to end flow. Look at your flow end to end and actually look for the delays in between each part of your process as well. So there's a kind of little takeaway for you if you want to break silos. Try and do a value stream map. Yeah, I'm about to also discuss, put another talk together around 
value chain mapping as well, which is a level higher than value That's stream mapping. Yeah. It's uh, very often businesses don't recognize very well their value chains are all siloed into functional areas and, and the flow works horizontally across the silos, yeah. which makes it really difficult. But it shows um, patches, doesn't it? Yeah. So it's quite revealing. Um, there's another one. Uh, your own self-reflection on ways of working. I think consistent and continuous reflection and with pivoting on improvement as well is quite a valuable piece. And a thing you could try there, maybe in a retro, um, try something like a 360 degrees of appreciation where you appreciate your colleagues and yourselves and uh, you then share those uh, results. And it's quite powerful what comes out. You get a real sight of um, what your capabilities are, how you're contributing to teams and uh, you know your, your areas as well. And bring in your stakeholders and see what happens there. So there's another brilliant one that I'd like to comment on here on rapid impediment escalation and resolution. Yeah. The idea of flow is that there isn't such a place to escalate and uh, to resolve things. Uh, the people work in the flow and the people doing the work are the ones to resolve those things. And, and the idea of agency is you don't have to escalate 10, 10 layers up or, or even three layers up. You need to be able to have colleagues to work with straight away to resolve those impediments. So it's not so much about the rapid escalation and resolution. It's actually to reduce the need for doing that. Well, that looks and, like and create system of works like that. It looks uh, like that's all we've got time for. I'm afraid it's 2.15. Um, but uh, I've just left uh, as a last note um, our, our details. So if you do want to ever get in touch with us, our emails are just there on the screen right now. Um, Philippe, thank you. And uh, is there thank anything you else you can add? Thank you very much for being my co-host and thank you all for participating kindly. Uh, that's always very good to have a probing of, of what's happening on the ground and participation of the audience. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for uh, participating. And uh, any more questions, please put them in the Slack. We'll be happy to answer them. Yep. Thank you so much, both of you, for the talk. It was a really interesting talk. And yes, guys, please carry on the conversations on Slack. And if you have any questions, for sure, both of them are there to answer those. So thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers, all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.